Well, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to come and preach before you to bring God's word to you. And thank you for being a faithful church here in Greenwood. Being a chaplain at the hospital is a hard position, but every time I come here into this congregation, I find refreshment and restoration. It's a place of res- refuge for me. And whenever, you know, either other chaplains or, you know, other people hear that I go to Greenwood, they usually say it's a good church. They hear good things about this church, and I hope you know that, um, that you are well known in this community and that you have a good reputation. And I also am very thankful for the friends and fellowship that I've cultivated here amongst you. And if we haven't met yet, you can blame me. I'm short, and I can easily get lost in the crowd. (laughs) Today is a special day, not because it's St. Patrick's Day, not because I am the one preaching, but because this is the Lord's Day. This is a day where his word is, his people are gathering together and hearing his word and finding restoration and refreshment from him. So I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 17, chapter 17, verses 1 through 23. And I'm going to read this, but I'm also going to skip ahead to verses 45 to 50. So if you have a Bible, feel free to follow along. But if you don't, feel free to listen. Now this is a familiar story. This is a story of David and Goliath. And what we're going to be looking at is who is the hero in this story? Who comes to Israel's rescue? Amen. Amen. (laughs) Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Domim between Soko and Azka. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels on his legs. He wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Elahab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. Now let's skip down to verse 45. To 50. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army in the, to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. 
As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with sling and stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's look to him in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you did not leave us without a word. You did not remain silent. But Lord, you have spoken into our lives through your word. You have spoken into our grief, into our hurt, into our suffering, into our fears through your word. So, Father, I lift up this congregation to you, and I ask, Lord, that you minister to them. Wherever they are right now, Lord, reach out to them. Know that you are near them and that you love them and that you care about them. I lift up myself to you, Lord, as I proclaim your word. May it be your words and not mine. Let what needs to be said be said. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Can you think of a time when you felt helpless? You might have been in a situation where you just felt like you could no longer move. You felt stuck. Maybe your car broke down on the side of the road, and you were literally stuck on the side of the road. Or maybe you were ill, seriously ill, or a relative of yours was seriously ill, and you didn't know how to heal them. Now, in situations like this, what do we usually do? If your car is stuck on the side of the road, you call a mechanic, and you hope that he's going to come in time. If you're sick or if your relative is sick, you call a doctor, you go to the hospital. But imagine this. You're stuck on the side of the road. You've called your mechanic and you're waiting for him. And instead of your mechanic showing up, it's a plumber. Or you're sitting in the hospital waiting for the doctor to come and diagnose your disease and give you how, uh, your prognosis, a way to heal your disease But instead of a doctor, once again, it's your heroic plumber who shows up. Now, a plumber in his own right is very skilled in his craft, but he's not who you would have expected in that moment. But within a moment, he's fixed your car and he's had you back on the road. Or he's diagnosed you and he's prescribed the right medication for you. You know, you might be a little confused at this. You might be a little uncertain about this. But in that moment, that plumber is what you needed. He's who you needed. In our passage today, Israel is in a dire situation. They're in danger. Why? Because their enemy, the Philistines, are invading them. They're coming into their country, and they're seeking to conquer Israel. And now they've challenged Israel to a a duel. They've sent out their champion, Goliath, who is well-trained and well-skilled to take on Israel's champion, But Israel doesn't have a champion to send forth. So they feel stuck. They're in a dangerous situation. They need a hero. They're wondering who their hero will be. They're holding out for a hero until the end of the night. He's got to be fast, and he's got to be strong, and he's got to be fresh from the fight. Israel needs a hero. And Israel gets a hero. And it's not who you expect and it's not who they expect. But, we, but, we, but before we know who he, uh, Israel's hero is, we have to understand who their foe is and how dangerous he is. Their foe is described in verses 4 through 7, and his name is, again, Goliath of Gath. And we see that there are three main things that make him very dangerous. The first is he's larger than most men. We read, And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span. So Goliath is tall. He's huge. Compared to them, he's huge. And so he has a natural physical advantage over his opponents. You know, cubits is a weird measurement to think about, but if we kind of translate it into our measurements, he's about seven feet to nine feet tall. 
Now, I want to ask you, when was the last time you saw someone that was seven foot or nine feet tall? I mean, that's an incredible height. That's almost as tall as me. <laughs> the second thing that makes Goliath dangerous is his armor. And in verse 5, his armor is described. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So we see here that Goliath is clothed in bronze armor. From his head to his toes, he's in bronze armor. Now, bronze at this period of history is the strongest metal that you can find. And Goliath is clothed from his head to his toes. He's in this armor. So think of Goliath as kind of a human tank, right? He's supposed to be impenetrable. Imagine trying to throw a stone at a modern tank. That would be a very difficult way to defeat a tank, would it? wouldn't it? And that's the situation that David is in, and that's also the situation that Israel's in. And we're going to see that in a moment, why that's so dangerous. Because let's compare his armor and his weapons to what Israel has. Now, Goliath also has weapons, and he has javelins, right? Javelins are a, a long-distance weapon, right? If an enemy is far away, Goliath has the advantage to throw his javelin at the enemy and strike his enemy before his enemy gets to him. And you may think, well, David has a slingshot, right? He has a slingshot, so he also has some range. That's true. And in this time, people with slingshots are kind of deadly. But once again, a smooth stone versus bronze armor is not going to do much. But Goliath's javelin, that's going to do a lot of damage. Goliath also carries a spear. Now, a spear in ancient times is a long weapon. It has a long reach. And the fact that Goliath is taller than most men means that his spear is much longer than most men. He has an advantage. And Goliath's final weapon is his sword. This is his secondary weapon. If his spear breaks or if he drops it, he has the chance to draw his sword and continue the fight. So we see that Goliath is well armored and he's well armed for this battle. He's, he's like a special forces, right? His, his, but his specialty is single combat. He's well prepared for this. Now let's compare his armor and his weapons to what the Israelites have. Their equipment is described in 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 through 20 and 22. Here's what we hear from this passage. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all of the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, at least the Hebrews make for themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his matak, his axe, and his sickle. So on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of the people with Saul and Jonathan. So look at what Goliath is armed with. He has bronze armor, he has javelins, he has a spear, he has swords. But now look at what Israel has. They have farm tools. They're going against the Philistines who have armor and swords and spears with farm tools. Who has the advantage in this battle? It's the Philistines. Who would have the advantage in single to single combat? It's Goliath. Now there's one final thing that makes Goliath a fearsome foe. And this aspect is more spiritual than it is physical. We see in this more t- detail when we look at how Goliath's armor is described. And it's described as scale armor. Now, there's something significant about this, is that the words used to describe Goliath's armor are shiryon and kashkash in Hebrew. Now, I'm saying this, and I, like, I want to talk about this for two reasons. First of all, kashkash is a really fun word, and I don't get to use it often. <laughs> Second of all, I think we're going to gain some insight into the author's world if we look at this just a little bit more closely. Shiryon is, uh, is a, a word that translates body armor. That's, that's pretty much it. It can be used for any kind of armor. In fact, later on in this passage, when Saul is giving David his armor, it's the same word. It's shirion. It's ar- body armor. However, the word to describe scales, kashkash, is not used for body armor. It's used for animals. So, for instance, in Leviticus, when they're describing the, the uh, dietary laws, it's used to describe the scales of fish. But there's another passage I want to draw your attention to, and that's Ezekiel 29, where God is describing Pharaoh as the great serpent of the Nile. 
And the word kashkash is used. God says, Behold, I'm against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon or serpent that lies in the midst of his streams, that says, My Nile is my own, I made it for myself. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales. And that word there for scales is what? It's kashkash. So when the author of this passage, when the Israelites are looking at Goliath and seeing armor, they're seeing scale armor, and they're comparing it, probably not the fish, because fish really aren't that threatening, but they're probably comparing it to serpent scales. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to place yourself in the shoes of an ancient Israelite who has read Genesis and the rest of Scripture. What other enemy might come to mind when you think of a serpent. It's a serpent in the Garden of Eden. The serpent who came into the garden and tempted Adam and enslaved Adam to sin. And to some degree, that's what's happening in this passage. right? Goliath is a human agent, for sure, but he's invading the promised land. He's invading the land that Israel is supposed to keep holy and pure. It's almost like a second Eden. right? Just as the Garden of Eden was where God's special presence and his holiness was, Israel was supposed to be that way. It was supposed to be a holy land where God's special presence was made known. And Goliath's invasion of Israel is threatening that holiness and is threatening the promises of God. We see this when he talks about what happens if he wins. He says that if he's defeated, he will, make, he will become a subject, a slave to Israel. But if Israel is defeated, if he defeats Israel's champion, he will make them his slaves. Genesis is, in a sense, being repeated. The serpent is invaded the garden again. Again, this is showing us that everything, everything that happens in the physical world is a reflection of what's going on in the spiritual world. The, the physical conflict, the wars and famines and even personal conflicts in your life are a reflection of of the spiritual conflict that is going on in the heavens. In other words, the whole cosmos, the whole heavens are at war with God. And this seems to be a a minute theological point, but all good theology is applied. And here's what I mean. Every one of you have faced suffering to some degree. Some strife, you know, maybe in a relationship, a strained relationship, maybe at work, at home, in your families. And it's, it can feel overwhelming. And you can feel stuck. And it may seem, when you face these things, when you face death, when you face suffering, when you face disease, it may seem that God's promises are being threatened. It's very hard to cling to God's promises when one of your loved ones is sick in the hospital and dying. It's very hard to cling to God's promises when you've been diagnosed with cancer. However, what we're going to see in this passage is there's someone in this passage who clings to God's promises despite the danger, who looks beyond the danger and sticks to God's promises. So again, we see that Goliath is a dangerous foe. Now, when a foe arises in a story, we expect the hero to arise and challenge that danger, that enemy. You know, when a a dragon appears in a fairy story, in a fantasy story, we expect a, a knight in shining armor to ride out and challenge the dragon. So here's the question, and here's the tension of this passage is, who will ride out and be Israel's hero? Well, it should have been Saul. Saul should have been the hero in this story. Saul should have been the one that challenged Goliath. Why? Because Saul was Israel's king. He was responsible for guarding Israel. He was responsible for guarding the promises of God. And we see this when we read 1 Samuel 10, when Saul is anointed. The Lord anointed you, Saul, to be prince over his people Israel. And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. So as king, Saul should have been Israel's savior. 
but he fails. I mean, think about where this passage begins. Where does it say the Philistines are? It says that they're in Soko, which is in Judah. So he's already failed to defend Israel's border. But again, Saul should have been the hero. Not just because he was the king, but he was also capable of fighting Goliath. We read that he, from, uh, in 1 Samuel 13, 44, we read, from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And later on in Samuel, we read that he has weapons, he has armor. Here's what it says. On, on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of the people with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan had them. So not only is Saul taller than most people, he, he, he's the most physically capable of challenging Goliath. He also has the right equipment to fight Goliath. So Saul should have ridden out and challenged Goliath. But where is Saul in this story? He's quivering. He's terrified. He's hiding out in his tent like all the rest of the Israelites. So Saul fails He fails to take up his duty. So who's the hero in this story? Is it David? Is the hero in this story David? From all appearances, he has no physical capability of taking on Goliath. What's constantly repeated in this passage is that David is small. He's just a child. He's just a boy. And he has no military experience. For example, Saul says this in verse 33 of this passage. You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. And when Goliath looks at David, his reaction is he's insulted. Because he says this. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth. And Goliath continues to say, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? So Goliath is looking and he's seeing this boy, this skinny, scrawny boy who has no armor, no weapons, is armed with a slingshot, and Goliath is insulted. But again, is David the hero in this story? The tension in this passage, again, Goliath is qualified. He has the armor. He has the weapons to take on the Israelite Israelite champion. And we look at David, and he has none of these things. It's almost like if you think of a boxing match. Goliath is the boxer who has fought 100 boxing matches and won them all. While David has fought zero. And he's one zero. Goliath has more experience. He has the armor. He has the weapons. And David has none of these. What does David think in this passage? Does David think that he is the hero in this passage? Hear what David has to say later on in this passage. He says this, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the of this Philistine. And he goes on to say in verses 46 through 47, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. So what's David's answer in this passage? He doesn't see himself as the hero. He sees God as the hero. You see, we are given a hero in this passage. And it's not Saul. And it's not David. It is God himself who saves. David is a great example of faith. Here he sees a giant foreign army invading his country. And he sees a giant champion facing his army. But I love David in this passage because when he struts into the Israelite camp and when he sees Goliath on the opposite end of the field, 
he comes across as pretty cocky. He's pretty confident. He basically says, I can take him. Why? Because he knows God's not, God is the one who's going to deliver him. God is the one who's going to defeat Goliath. Because David knows that God promised his people that they would have Israel and that he would keep his covenant with Israel and protect them. David isn't looking at the danger ahead of him. He's looking beyond it. He's looking beyond his circumstances to see that there's someone greater behind his circumstances, and that's his God. I have a story from my youth about this. I used to have a dog named Honey. and She was part pug, part Jack Russell Terrier. She was a small dog, and we were wandering through the woods, and we came across a creek, or as some people say, a crick. Now, this creek wasn't really that too deep for me. The waters were flowing pretty quickly. But they weren't that deep for me. They probably went up to my knees. And I knew that I could cross this stream on smooth, slippery stones. I had the ability to go across my, on my own. And I knew if I tried to carry my dog, I probably would slip and fall and get wet. But I wanted to see what she would do if I didn't carry her across the stream. So I crossed by myself. And when I looked back... I saw her, and she was just looking at me. She didn't look scared. She looked content. I think she knew. I don't know what was going on in her doggy brain in that moment, but I think she knew that I would go back and retrieve her, and that's exactly what I did. I went back. I picked her up, and in the middle of crossing, yes, I did slip, but I made sure I landed on my tush and kept her close to myself so she didn't get injured. So I was the one that got wet, and I was the one that got slightly bruised, but she was fine, and that's all that mattered to her. But what sticks out to me in the story is that she didn't try and go her own way. She, she didn't try and find another way around. She stayed put, and she looked towards me. And that's what we see David doing. We see him staying put. He's not fleeing. In fact, he runs towards the danger because he knows that God is going to defend him. Think about Exodus 14, 14 for a moment, where it says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. David knows this. He's read these words, and he's clinging to these words, and he knows that God is the God who brought his people out of Egypt. He is recalling all the great things that God has done for him. He's thinking about his Bible. He's meditating on his Bible so that he can remember the promises of God. That is what gives David faith here. That is what encourages him to face the danger. So whenever you face things in your life that feel overwhelming, I want you to know that, yes, that pain is real. Whatever fear and sorrow and overwhelmingness that you feel is real. But I would encourage you to keep reading the scriptures. It's not, fi- not going to fix it in the, things in the moment, but it will keep you through. Reminding yourself of who God is and what he's promised to do in your life that he's promised to save you, that will keep you going. But there's a a larger application that I want us to apply to ourselves today. Like Israel, you and I are facing a terrifying foe who's much bigger than the Philistines and much bigger than Goliath. And this foe is sin, death, and the devil. Sin is our great foe because we are guilty of it, right? It's It's in our nature, Paul says this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Psalm 130 says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? And Paul goes on to say in Romans 3, 9 through 11, what shall we conclude then? Do we have an advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the the same power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. That is the state of humanity apart from God. We're not looking for God. We're not trying to understand God. Instead, we're trying to go our own way. We're trying to find our own way to be saved. And we have to remember that we aren't sinners because we sin. It's not what we do that makes us sinners. We sin because we're sinners. It's in our nature. I want you to think about if you're walking through the woods and you stumble across a nest of squirrels, baby squirrels. You can look at the squirrels and you can know that those squirrels 
in the winter, I go out and they gotta gather nuts. Once they grow up, they, once they mature and become adults, they gotta grow up and gather nuts and you know hibernate in the winter. In the same way, if you look upon a, a human baby, you can know that as they grow up, they are going to make mistakes. They are going to sin. It's in our nature. It's we we aren't we 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 do what we are, and so sin condemns us. Because in order to be with God, in order to be in heaven, in order to be a part of his people, you have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's what Jesus says. Your righteousness has to be as good as God's righteousness. Your goodness has to be as pure and as good as God's purity. And because of our nature, we can't reach that standard on our own. The second enemy that we face is is death. And it's a physical death, yes, but our physical deaths point to the the spiritual death. Sin causes us to be separated from God, right? The wages of sin is death. It takes us away from God. It draws us away from God. I think some of the best illustrations of death are actually when Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, right? They're cast out of God's special presence. They're cast out of that blessing. And we see this repeated throughout scriptures. You know, in the Levitical law, whenever someone was unclean or, or sinned, what happened to them? They were cast out of the camp for a number of days. But we also see this at Jesus' crucifixion. The author of Hebrews draws on this at the end of his book where he says that Jesus was crucified outside the camp. He was crucified outside of the city. And in that passage, he's comparing Jesus to what happens to the sacrificial animals. Death is kind of a catch-all in the Bible. Yes, it refers to physical death, but it also refers to the suffering that we face in this world. The rea- it points us to the reality that everything in this world is fading away because we've been separated from God. If you go out and you pluck wildflowers in the field and you put them in a vase, what's going to happen to them? They're going to die eventually, right? Their leaves and petals are going to fall off. And when you see the leaves and the petals falling off, you know that those plants are starting to die. Why are they dying? It's because they've been cut off from the source of their life. They've been cut off from the soil. They've been cut off from their roots. And so they're fading away and dying. And that's what happens to us humans is that because we are cut off from God, because we were cut off from God, We fade. We fade away. And we see this. We see this when our relatives die. We see this when people are sick in the hospital. The last foe that we face is the devil himself. He's an intelligent being. He thinks and he connives and he, 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 he creates strategies of how to tempt us into our sin. Right? He tries to corrupt us. Jesus himself describes the devil like this. You belong to your father. This is in John 8, 44. The devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. But there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. I'm going to read this in 1 Peter 5 through 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I've been slowly kind of going down the road of enjoying country music. And one of the artists I've stumbled on is a guy named Colby Akoff, and he has a song called If I Was the Devil. Now, this is a strange title. Like, why would someone create a song like this? But you got to kind of think that, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters where he's reflecting on what it would be like to, you know, be a demon trying to tempt someone. And in the Puritan tradition, there's a book called Remedies Against Satan's Devices or Against Satan's Strategies. So in the Christian tradition, in our tradition, there's, we have people looking back and reflecting on who Satan is and how he tries to tempt people. But in this song, Colby Alcoff says this, If I were the devil, first thing that I do is I come off like I ever cared about you. I let you catch a peek of all your greatest desires, and I watch with the 
as the flame in your eyes burned like hellfire. So what he's saying is, what the devil does is he, he pretends like he loves you. He pretends like he actually cares about you and he wants what's best for you. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. That's the most dangerous thing about the devil. You know, when we, you know, in our, in our contemporary portrayals of the devil, he, you know, we, we dress him up like, our, you know, with horns and with a pitchfork and wings. But as the, the Bible describes him, he's, he appears like a messenger of God. What the devil does is he takes a little bit of what God's truth is and he weaves it within into falsehood, into his lies. So that we're tempted to think that what is untrue is true. I, in school, one of the types of tests I did not like to take were multiple choice. And here's why. Because you could have four different answers to a question, and there's only one right answer. But what tended to happen is a teacher would put a little bit of the right answer into the wrong answers. So for instance, option A might be George Washington was the first president of the United States. The second, George Washington was the first president of the United States, and he served for 20 terms. Third answer, George Washington was president of the United States, and he had a peg leg. So what usually would happen with me with these tests is I would see the right answer and the false answers, and I would start questioning what was the right answer, because I saw the, that part of the right answer were in the wrong answers. That's what the devil is like. And the people who are, um, succept, who are, are vulnerable to these types of attacks by the devil are the people who don't know Scripture well. Because when you read the Bible and when you understand its counsel, you are able to compare what the devil says to what God says. But ultimately, the devil's desire is to see your destruction and your corruption so that you cannot inherit eternal life. And he has his own religion and his own spirituality And we hear this all throughout our culture. Live your own truth. Or all truths are equal. All truths are valid. That's what we hear in our culture are those things. What you have to be aware of is the devil's religion is polytheistic. It's polytheism. It's multiple truths. It's multiple gods. And you see this throughout all of human history is the false religions are the ones with the multiple gods or the multiple truths. And as you look at ancient history, you'll see that what they tended to do, even in ancient times, if you look at the Near East or you look at the ancient Mediterranean world, is they used to take a little bit of this one god and mix it with another one of another god. So I was looking through Instagram one day, and I came across an uh, ancient sculpture, and it was Zeus Amun is what it was entitled. It was a combination of the Greek god Zeus and the Egyptian god Ra. That's what happened in ancient times, is they would take a little bit of this quote-unquote truth and mix it with this quote-unquote truth. And basically, it was a have-it-your-way type of religion. And that's what we're seeing in our culture. It's the same old lies told differently. The devil is telling the same old lies differently. And the, the, the thing is, humans are vulnerable to these lies because we suffer. And the devil knows this. He knows that our suffering makes us vulnerable. He finds the sheep who is wandering away from the flock and wandering away from the shepherd. And he offers that sheep bread to eat. And the bread on the outside looks good and delicious. It looks sweet and savory. But on the inside, it's filled with maggots and mold. He leaves them and he says, I will take you to green pastures. But he fails to clarify but that the plants that are green in these pastures are thorn bushes and weeds. Plants that won't give the sheep sustenance. And so when we look at our culture, when we look at people in this world who are unbelievers or are following false philosophies or theologies, we have to understand the reason why they're responding to these things is because they're suffering and they see that a need, their needs are being met in these false things. Therefore, it's important as God's church to go out and proclaim the truth. 
I saw a quote somewhere, I think it came from Spurgeon, where he says, the best way of showing that a crooked stick is crooked is by setting a straight stick next to it. It's not by straightening out the crooked stick. It's by showing that the crooked stick is crooked. And that's what the church is called out to do. It's called to proclaim God's word and show that the things that are false in our culture and in our world are false. They're not going to lead to salvation and they're not going to feed you. So those are our enemies. And it's hard to overcome them because they're more powerful than us. Right? Sin is in our nature. We're prone to be tempted to do what we want to do, which is often against God's own will and desire. Death is something that we succumb to eventually. And the devil is a scheming tempter. He's clever. However, although we can't save ourselves from these enemies, there's something good about them. These things are not all-powerful. And these things are not all-knowing. But we have an all-knowing and an all-powerful God who is holy and pure. And our Father who is in heaven has sent us a Savior. And once again, it's not you. And it's not me. It is Christ Jesus himself. God the Father sent God the Son to save us from our sins, to deliver us from our sins. And how does he do this? If you look back at this passage in 1 Samuel, you'll see that Goliath, David triumphs over Goliath by slaying him with Goliath's own sword, by Goliath's own power. What Jesus did was he slayed sin, death, and the devil by using their own power against them. Behind me is a giant wooden cross. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. In the first century, that cross represented suffering. It represented torture, and it represented death. Because that's what this was used for in the first century. It was a torture device. It was an execution device. But when Christ died on it, it becomes something completely different. It no longer symbolizes death and torture. Instead, it symbolizes eternal life. This has now become the tree of life. Christ himself has now become the tree of life. Why? Because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may have the righteousness of God. Through Christ's death and resurrection, he has given us his righteousness. He has given us his holiness. And that's how he has conquered sin. And he has taken our sin upon himself and he put it to death on the cross. And now he has given us eternal life. I was flipping through the Bible earlier this morning and I came across this passage in Romans. Romans 8.10. And here's what it says. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life. Because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So in other words, Christ has died for us and through dying the death that we deserve by by going under God's wrath and suffering under God's wrath for us, Christ paid the wages of sin for us. He paid our wages What we deserve because of our sin, Christ has paid for us. And in return, he has given us eternal life. He has given us his life. In a sense, he has taken us, think back to the, the flowers in the vase. He has taken us from the vase and replanted us in the soil. He has reconnected us to God. He's reconnected us to the source of our life. And he himself has become our life for us. And it cannot be taken away. So sin and death are conquered, but the devil is also conquered because the devil wants you to sin so that he can accuse you of sin before God. But when the devil accuses you now, Christ says, wait a minute. I died for him. I died for her. They're covered. Their wages are paid. They owe me nothing. And the devil is silenced. 
right? Our mighty fortress and our God, it says one mighty word will fell him, him being the devil. What's that word? Is Jesus. As soon as you whisper Jesus to the devil, he, he slides back. He slithers back into his hole because he knows he cannot overcome Christ. Now, if we look at this passage again in 1 Samuel at the end of this, we see that after David claims the victory for Israel, what the Israelites do is they go out and they collect the spoil. Right? They, they take all of the Philistines' possessions. And in the same way, what Christ did for us is after he won the victory for us, he has now given us the spoils from our enemies. He has given us reconciliation. He has given us redemption. He has given us eternal life. And he has given us, again, an unguilty conscience. But he has also given us the church. Right? Remember, Christ died for his church. He died for a community of believers. He died for us gathered here today. He gathered for the true churches who are gathered throughout the world today. And the reason why Christ gave us the church is because he knows that it takes a village. Right? It takes a village to develop faith. Faith is a gift from God. It comes from him. It's, a, it's something that he has given us through his Holy Spirit. But he has also given us the church to disciple us and help us grow in our faith. I want you to think about this. David himself was in God's people, right? He grew up amongst God's people, which means he had a mother and a father who taught him the scriptures. He had brothers and and siblings who taught him the scriptures. And he had elders who taught him the scriptures and other people in his community who taught him the scriptures, who discipled him. And if you, I'm reading Acts right now, and I, I got to the Paul where Paul has been converted. And what sticks out is Paul had to be discipled, right? When Paul converted, you have two groups of Christians. You have the Christians that say, hey, look, we heard what Paul did in Jerusalem, and we want nothing to do with him. But then we have the Christians like Barnabas and like the other apostles who take Paul in, and they teach him God's word and God's promises, and they disciple Paul. My point is we need the church. It's a blessing. It's a gift. and something that we should treasure. Now, I know that the church can often sometimes be a broken place, right? It's filled with people who struggle with their sins, and because of this, we can be overcome, you know, it can feel like a broken place, but still valuable, it's still important. The last thing that I want to talk about that Christ gives us is found in Revelation 21. I'm going to flop over to that real quick. This is what our inheritance looks like. This is Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What we as God's people are inheriting, what is coming our way, is this new world, this new heavens, this new earth, where all causes of sin, all temptations are going to be gone. Wars and famines and things will be rumors of the past. There will be a distant memory. This world will be resurrected. We will be resurrected with Christ in our bodies. And the rest of this world will be resurrected too. These are the things that we receive from Christ and we receive it through faith. Through trusting God. Through believing what God says he's going to fulfill. And we must be like David. Just as David trusted God to deliver him from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, and from the hand of Goliath, we have to trust God to deliver us from sin, death, and the devil. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for it being proclaimed and preached to us. As we go out now, Lord, let us treasure these things up in our heart so that we may remember you and love you and serve you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.